we got a phone call in January from another consultant uh, giving us a heads up that something very big would be happening and the numbers that were mentioned and how it would affect us as an intensive care unit was really quite frightening. It was a, something new that we've never treated before. We have lots of things that we treat in intensive care and we know how to treat them, but we didn't initially know how to treat COVID. I fell ill at home um, the end of March. I remember going in the ambulance, being taken out on a stretcher from our house. I do remember coming in to the IUH. Uh, 24 hours later, I was put into a coma. We had to make that horrible phone call to him, like obviously being told that it might be the last time we ever speak to him because obviously it was very likely that he wasn't going to make it, you know, nobody knew. I was on 100% oxygen. I developed kidney failure, blood clots, um, bowel failure, sepsis. Obviously I didn't know nothing of this, obviously Zoe and the family were living it. They couldn't do much else for me, so then they contacted a team in Royal Brompton, London, who travelled down and put me on an ECMO machine and then took me back to the Royal Brompton. Well, Zoe was told that was my last chance, and then I was returned to the RUH bath. There's not many of these machines around, so it's just like how yeah. they gave him that chance was just amazing. During the pandemic, the last lockdown, I caught COVID and unfortunately also had sepsis and pneumonia at the same time. I didn't really remember much beforehand coming into hospital or became very ill, which meant that I had to be put into a coma and into intensive care. I was in intensive care, I think it was five, five weeks um, before I was um, stepped down to a ward. My COVID experience started at Christmas. We'd been very cautious about making a decision to spend Christmas together in the circumstances. But unfortunately, one of us got COVID, then all of us got it. My COVID appeared to be a lot worse. And I was minutes or, or maybe a couple of hours away from passing away. When I got into the hospital, I was immediately um, ventilated. I could just send a couple of text messages to tell close friends where I was and what was happening and then that was it. The lights went out for me and I descended into this cavern for over two weeks which is when I was in a coma essentially. I stayed in intensive care for 33 days. A lot of these patients did end up sort of with quite severe delirium which is something we do see in IT all the time. They are on a lot of medications. There was some really really bad sort of delirium that people experience. You have these unbelievable dreams. I was buried under snow, I was <laughs> chased on the back of a motorbike through uh, Seoul in Korea. I would swear blind actually happened. When I eventually did open my eyes, I think it was around 42 days, I thought I'd been in there two days. And I had, obviously I didn't know where I was, didn't know what was going on. I couldn't speak when I came to, and I couldn't move, I couldn't write, I couldn't move my legs. So I couldn't communicate, and so that was very challenging. The staff in critical care are very, very good at looking after families. The patient is often on a ventilator, um, and the way we build up that history and story of the patient is through the families sat at the bedside day in, day out. COVID took that away from us. I think if I had to pick the most important thing would be ringing the families because quite often the patient is asleep and the families are the ones on a day-to-day -day basis that are struggling but also to find out what the patient normally likes so think small things like what are their normal hobbies what does their normal day look like what music do they listen to in the day once the ward round had finished the doctors would go away and ring the families and give a daily update of what was happening they hold on to that that daily phone call and that information and I think if we can learn one thing, it's about getting that daily phone call and information right. One of my best friends, Jane, was the point of contact for the hospital and my network. And every day they get a call at six o'clock to give them an update. And the doctor will go into quite a lot of detail to explain, 
you know, my current symptoms and where I was at. And on a number of occasions, I think she was given some fairly bad news. It was touch and go a couple of times. Karen said that she started to dread the phone calls because every time somebody phoned, something else had happened to me, i.e. I had a stroke during the coma and, and several other, other things happened. I would take the call, we'd put it on loudspeaker and my daughter would just jot everything down on bits of paper because there was just so much that they were, you know, would be saying. My daughter started just sort of writing a diary. We'd go back through all the notes and, yeah, sort of try mm. and put everything together, really. Day one, this is when I was admitted. This goes all the way through to Thursday, the 21st of May. We picked you up. Mm -hmm. That diary has been really powerful. Um, we've shared it with the, the junior doctors that have just started in critical care now. You know, I think the diary is being shared with quite a lot of people now and it gives an insight to what families are going through and what the doctors are going through. Patient diaries are, we make them for any of our high risk patients. Ideally every shift there should be an entry written in. So, And this can be written by any health professional that has worked with the patient. It normally just includes a little bit of a summary of what medically is going on during the day. So we'll write sort of how awake they are and sort of if there's any changes in their medical condition. Having the diary really helped Gary actually yeah. when he came home. It's very common that three months down the line they won't even remember any of their stay on IT. Well they might have snippets but actually the full picture they don't have. So the diaries I think the main thing is just for the patients when they leave ITU is to read it back and just have an idea of sort of what they did when and what was happening. Some of our staff have absolutely gone that extra mile with, with our COVID patients to make their experience and their family's experience better. So for example, we had a patient who celebrated his 50th birthday in, um, in critical care. He was in a coma on his 50th birthday, but we still bought him some 50 balloons, put them at the end of his bed, and at least sent that image to his family so that they could see that we were, we were recognising that it was his 50th birthday on that day. I remember when we were speaking to the nurses, they gave me the comfort and made me feel a bit better because I knew they were doing all of the things like that I should have been doing, like being by his side, holding his hand, talking to him. Vaguely, I can remember now from when I was in the coma, they would say, um, if you can hear me, if you can hear me, you're okay. Squeeze my hand, you're in hospital. And I remember all of that coming back to me once I'd got home from hospital. The days are really long in hospital. You know, you can't do anything, you can't move. The nurses become such an emotional support for you as well. People like that just just broke the day I've made it. Not as monotonous, um, you know, when you're having a bad day, when you wasn't feeling well. It definitely helps, yeah. Somebody bought me a cup of tea at three o'clock in the morning and I could only just touch it with a sponge on my lips. And that's the first thing I'd tasted, you know, since I'd been ill. It was the best cup of tea I've ever had, even though it was on a green sponge. Um, and one nurse called Grace, she just sat there and stroked my head. And it just made me feel a lot better. It's really small things go a long, long way when you're suffering. Even just to get home, that, that was the start of our journey, wasn't it? You know, I, could, I barely had function of a lot of my body. I couldn't walk. I was on a Zimmer frame. I'm trying to get around the house, we're having, we've had to have a few adaptations. A nurse called Alex, he wrote this plan out. So I had something to work towards and had daily goals that I had to achieve and I became utterly determined to get out of hospital and to walk again. That was a big turning point in my recovery. Jenny from the yeah, IUH, Jenny, yeah. she would be in contact with me virtually weekly when I came out, talking to me, um, helping me. She would then get in touch with different, yeah. different departments and then they would then be getting in contact with us. All questions. Just all things like that. Answered, going, that and, sort of thing. and she yeah. was only, she was also a counsellor, but she also went that extra mile to get assistance for us, to help us. I was astonished at the amount of care that I received from the NHS post-hospital. They helped me shower, 
up the stairs, eventually I could go up and down the stairs. Now with the long COVID team in Wiltshire, so I'm getting quite a bit of support from them physio as well to help me legs get stronger. The stroke nurses keep in touch just to make sure everything's going in the right direction or if I need any help. Very fortuitously, we set up a follow-up clinic um, for patients coming out of critical care just before COVID hit. That um, has been absolutely fundamental um, for supporting our patients. It's that thing of being able to speak to people that you recognise and that also completely understand what you've been through. A couple of months once they've been discharged out of critical care, they then are invited back to our follow-up clinic where they have the opportunity to speak to a consultant, a psychologist and a nurse and the physiotherapist to see with all of those um, components how we can help them. Our team need to set up an exercise class. Most people for a year or more after ITU will be deconditioned. They won't be as strong as they were before. Most people won't feel like they want to go into a normal gym. They probably want to be surrounded by people that are in a similar situation to them. And I think it's just that ability to be able to talk to people is the best thing. The psychology has proved fundamental to that and that psychology post-critical care has, has been um, really, really important for those long-term COVID patients. The performance of my team has been outstanding. We have asked them to do above and beyond. We've had to work in ways that didn't sit comfortably with us because of the volume of patients we saw coming through. I can't express how proud I am of my team. There's nothing that they yeah. could have done differently in, in my eyes. There was nothing they could have done. They no. did everything as best they could, totally. I'd just like to thank everybody that was involved in my care during my, my time here. Um, without that, I obviously wouldn't be sat here talking to you. Anybody new coming into intensive care, the one thing I will say that really helped me was go and talk to the patients if they're awake. I would say that whoever you're treating is really interested in probably your story, who you are, you know, and, and just sit with them, for, even if it's just 30 seconds. The main thing is being kind to yourself. Try and not put too much pressure on yourself in terms of how much you can achieve within a day. Hopefully we end up to a lot of patients feeling sort of like a familiar face. So I think that's the main thing that we provide sometimes. I view every single moment of life is a precious gift and I think I've been given a gift mostly due to this amazing hospital and the staff who were my family um, and I'm so grateful to them and I think about them every day so I'm one of the lucky ones I really am